to that. We're going to start. Okay. The select committee will come to order, and our third witness will sit down at some point before, uh, you know, we're done with our opening statements. Uh, the clerk will now play a video. Chinese leaders have always believed that power derives from control of both the physical battlefield and the cultural domain. For Wang, Stalin, Mao, and Mao Zhi, words are not vehicles of reason and persuasion, they are bullets. And Americans should be concerned, because Xi Jinping's ambitions for ideological control are to remake the entire world, according to the CCP. What uh, the Chinese call discourse power, people's liberation army, has developed the concept of three warfare, which is to say public opinion, legal, and psychological warfare as key components of its psychological cognitive warfare efforts. The Eiffel Book Department, as well as the core agencies of the Chinese Communist Party, are trying to make sure that members of if the Chinese communities around the world are answering the Chinese Communist Party's call and placing people sympathetic to the Chinese Communist Party as representatives of these groups. The CCP doesn't just target Chinese nationals, they want to influence American students as well. They know college campuses present easy targets for anti-American messaging. It's why they planted Confucius Institutes on our campuses. The Chinese Communist Party tries to influence media around the world. There are more than a dozen radio stations in the cities across the country where Americans hear subtle pro Beijing propaganda on the FM radio. Think about TikTok is it is owned by a Chinese company. The Americans were told to remove references to Tiananmen Square. The Chinese government could control the recommendation algorithm, uh, which could be used for influence operations. Think about four foreign films are allowed into China each year, with a highly good reason to self-censor what Beijing doesn't like. If you want to have any access to the China market, you don't stand up to China. And Xi Jinping sitting down to, to deal with some of America's top CEOs, one business executive in attendance told the Wall Street Journal it was propaganda at its finest. The Chinese Communist Party seeks total control. Perhaps most importantly, it means thought control. China's Navy is now the largest in the world, and it's purpose-built for a cross-strait operation to invade or blockade Taiwan. And many China watchers around Washington, D.C. believe that the Taiwan Strait could be the most important battlefield of the 21st century. But that's not actually what the CCP thinks. In Xi Jinping's view, the war has already started on the most important battlefield, which is your mind. The CCP calls it cognitive domain warfare, part of their larger political warfare strategy. In a handbook on military political work, she stated, quote, the crumbling of a regime always starts in the realm of ideas. Changing the way people think is a long-term process. Once the front lines of human thought have been broken through, other defensive lines also become harder to defend. The realm of ideas, according to the document, is a smokeless battlefield. Cognitive warfare is not something we tend to think about here in the West, we have ideas like soft power, but they're not really a national strategy. We don't really do propaganda here. After all, there's nowhere you can find a more scathing critique of the United States and its government than in the New York Times or on Fox News on any given day. We don't have any equivalent of a United Front Work Department, China's global industrial scale influence operation. We don't have colossal state media apparatuses. On the smokeless battlefield of people's minds, we don't have a standing military at all. So the question is, how do we fight back on that battlefield of people's minds while also staying true to our values? That's the question we have for our hearing witnesses tonight. But before we get there, I want to share another quote from Xi Jinping. In a 2013 speech at the National Propaganda and Ideology Work Conference, Xi issued a call to arms. And he said, innovate foreign propaganda methods, strengthen discourse system construction, strive to forge new concepts, new categories, and new expressions that circulate between China and the outside world. Tell China's story well, disseminate China's voice well, and strengthen our discourse power internationally. When I read Xi's call to innovate foreign propaganda methods, I'll admit my mind immediately jumped to TikTok. That quote is almost a perfect description, albeit in CCP speak, of the TikTok platform. On Xi's smokeless battlefield, TikTok is the perfect weapon. It's camouflaged in plain sight. Tonight, we're going to examine some data later about how TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, has, in Xi's words, strengthened China's discourse power. 
But it's important to note that in 2018, the CCP shut down ByteDance's news aggregator because it posted content that goes against socialist core values. And in a groveling self-criticism, the founder of ByteDance apologized for failing to respect socialist core values and deviating from public opinion guidance and failing to realize that socialist core values are the prerequisite to technology. Following this, ByteDance announced a new strategy to hire 4,000 extra censors and integrate socialist core values into its technology. ByteDance's editor-in-chief and the secretary of ByteDance's CCP committee vowed to ensure that the algorithm would follow the correct political direction. So in the best case scenario, TikTok is just CCP spyware. That's why so many state and national governments have banned it on official phones. That's why we've banned it on government phones. But in the worst case scenario, TikTok is perhaps the largest malign influence operation ever conducted. Allowing a CCP-controlled entity to become the dominant media platform, the dominant news platform in America, would be a huge mistake, in my opinion. It would be as if, in 1962, at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, we allowed Pravda and the KGB to purchase the New York Times, the Washington Post, ABC, and NBC, and that probably understates the scope, uh, the scope, the scope of the problem. So make no mistake, the battlefield of our minds is already joined, and Congress must act with urgency to prevent the CCP from seizing the high ground. And with that, I recognize the ranking member, Roger Christian Morthy, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I begin, I'd like to share a message with all of you. Now, before you ask, the answer is no. Donald Trump did not become fluent in Mandarin since he left the White House. In fact, this video is not even real. It's an AI-generated deep fake from TikTok that came from the PRC. During our time on this committee, we've seen how our strategic competition with the CCP has unfolded across many sectors. Tonight, we're here to discuss the CCP's efforts to conduct, quote, discourse power, or what some experts described as information warfare, and the CCP's use of social media in the same. This deep fake of Donald Trump is a peek into what the future holds for all of us. As technology improves, so too will deep fake's ability to run undetected across social media. Tonight, I want to highlight two points. First, the threat that new social media technologies pose to our national security. And second, how such tactics fit into the authoritarian playbook used by the CCP. Now first, we're already familiar with the threats that existing technologies pose. In 2016, we saw firsthand how Russia used social media to sow domestic discord, muddy people's news feeds, and interfere on our elections. Now we're seeing how pro-CCP forces have adopted similar tactics. Take this news story about the Maui wildfires, for example. The headline reads, is America behind the Hawaii wildfires? MI6 says it was a weather weapon experiment. The article's text wildly claims the fires were a, quote, deliberate act of sabotage. This story was part of a disinformation campaign that over 85 pro-CCP accounts spread across 15 social media platforms. As we head into the 2024 elections, we must now contend with additional technologies like the deep fake video you just saw, and these present new challenges. One video featuring fake Donald Trump is alarming enough, but similar tactics applied on a broader scale by a foreign adversary present challenges we have never seen before. Of course, we cannot talk about the CCP's influence over online content without discussing TikTok, as the, as the chairman pointed out. As many of you know, TikTok's parent corporation is ByteDance, a PRC-based company. According to independent analysts, there are many cases where ByteDance and TikTok suppressed content unfavorable to the CCP. This is unacceptable and raises the concern that social media platforms in the U.S. are subject to coercion by the CCP or even other regimes. Put in the wrong hands, on online influence operations can foment unrest, sway elections, and in the worst circumstances, 
could cause political violence. This is the authoritarian playbook. That leads me to my second point. The CCP is intent on using its authoritarian playbook. The intent is clear in Chairman Xi Jinping's own words in a 2013 speech called Telling China's Story Well. He outlines that telling China's story well means, quote, doing a good job in external propaganda. To Chairman Xi, the emphasis is on painting a pretty picture, not an accurate one. This is the challenge we face, a tech-savvy CCP intent on twisting narratives to undermine the U.S. and come out on top in the strategic competition. If we turn our heads and look away, we risk ceding control of our public discourse to the CCP. We must be resolute in embracing facts and repelling malign influence operations. This starts with being clear-eyed about the challenges we face and leaning hard, leaning hard on our values of truth and democracy. I look forward to the discussion tonight on the CCP's information manipulation tactics and how together we can combat them moving forward. I yield back. Thank you. I forgot to mention we have a new ex officio member of the committee. Uh, uh, Hale Barr was born when? Andy Barr's new baby. The 15th of November. The 15th of November. Congratulations. Right. Yes. And I, I, sh I should note that when Andy was showing pictures of the Barr baby, the ranking member asked, is that your grandson? Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, you don't look that old, Andy. Uh, uh, th uh, if any other member wishes to submit a statement for the record without objections, those statements will be added to the record. Okay. Uh, we have three great witnesses tonight. Uh, Mr. John Garno is a senior fellow at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. He is also a co-author of the fantastic submission to the Australian Senate Select Committee on Foreign Interference through social media on TikTok, ByteDance, and their ties to the Chinese Communist Party. And without objection, this report shall be added to the official hearing record. Dr. Miles Yu is a senior fellow and director of the China Center at the Hudson Institute, and Ms. Yachu Wang is the research director for China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan at Freedom House. Welcome, thank you all of you for being here. If you could just please stand, raise your right hand, and I'll now swear you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and beliefs, so help you God? You may be seated. Let the record show that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you all. Mr. Garno, you are recognized for your opening remarks for five minutes. All right, thank you for your insight. Have fun. All right. All right, thank you, sir. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's right, yeah. I'm, I'm huge on TikTok, yeah. Mr. Gar Mr. Garno, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Um, Krishnamurthy, for having me here today, and particularly for your commitment to bipartisanship on this extremely important subject of, um, of China and foreign interference. John, could you just bring the mic closer to your mouth? Sure. So, yeah. <laughs> we have grandparents on this committee, you know, as was established before. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, let me thank you both for, um, that's much better, for having me here today and for your commitment to bipartisanship on this extremely important subject. I also want to acknowledge my uh, co-witnesses here, Yao Chou and Miles, have done more than I could ever dream of to, um, to help the world understand um, uh, the long arm of the Chinese state and how it reaches into particularly our diaspora communities. Um, so I'm delighted to be here today with both of you. Now. My work in this space began actually with concerns about the way that the Chinese state was, uh, was diminishing the citizenship rights of, um, of Chinese Australian citizens. Um, that concern of mine uh, continues, uh, but it helped to motivate me to participate in a study that um, the Australian government, the Prime Minister at the time, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, uh, commissioned on authoritarian interference in the Australian political ecosystem. That was in, uh, completed in 2017, in July. Uh, and the following month, I returned to Canberra to explain, um, explain something which was really important but quite difficult to 
explain to time poor political leaders and government leaders, and that is the importance of Communist Party ideology in order to see the patterns, um, in order to see the trends that we're uh, concerned about and how they, what motivates them, what drives them, we really need to take the time to unpack Chinese Communist Party ideology. Now, at the time, that was, um, that was August 2017, and my talk was titled Engineers of the Soul. Now, engineers of the soul is one of the great totalitarian metaphors. Um, it's a metaphor for a machine that collapses individuals, uh, nation, state, and party together. That's what the engineering project is about. And that was actually a quote from Joseph Stalin uh, in the early 1930s. Uh, but it was a quote that was borrowed and used again by Mao Zedong in the Yan'an rectification uh, movement in his talks on literature and art. And that was the job of literature and, uh, and art workers, and that is writers, uh, that is artists, to be engineers of the soul uh, on behalf of the uh, Communist Party project. And that was also um, a quote uh, from Xi Jinping early in his, uh, in his reign when he convened his own Beijing Forum on Literature and Art. So Xi Jinping is directly borrowing the language and the ideology um, that lies beneath it. And I think that's important. He's used this concept also to describe the roles of education workers, teachers in the Chinese system. Now, since then, in August 2017, I think governments around the world, certainly ours in Australia, uh, have done quite a lot to begin to recognise this challenge of authoritarian interference. It's Russia, it's China, it's other states, um, but certainly China looms very large. They've gotten a lot done and they've got a lot more to do. Um, but it's still not clear that governments around the world have come to terms with the extent of the ambition of Xi Jinping's project. So in order to build a framework that has explanatory and predictive value, in order to keep up with Xi's China, we need to do a better job of grappling with the ideology that frames the language, perceptions and decision making of Chinese leaders. To sort signal from noise, we need to understand the ideological lens through which they view our world. This process of interpreting party internal guidance involves hard work. It requires interrogation of sources to identify messages, um, how they are delivered, who they're delivered to, for what purpose. Uh, and it is complicated by the fact that the party also runs a parallel external messaging system that is not designed to convey the signals of policy truth. Um, I'll in illustrate with a couple of examples. Uh, one example, I think, was just a couple of weeks ago in San Francisco, the, um, the summit between Xi Jinping and Joseph Biden. A lot of the, most of the media commentary that I saw um, talked about uh, new stabilisation and how uh, Xi Jinping had come because he was under pressure at home with the economy, under pressure uh, uh, from international governments around the world, and he needed to, to essentially sue for peace, to buy stability in the relationship. Uh, and it was interpreted as, you know, now we can have, you know, you know, a while, a year or so, I've heard, of, you know, of, 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 um, of calm in the relationship, uh, particularly in relation to Taiwan. Now, um, that's perhaps the message that Xi Jinping delivered to businessmen um, that night, um, and it's perhaps, you know, what was delivered in the photographs, the images of the photographs, but that's not what he told Xi Jinping, uh, Joseph Biden, according to uh, senior administration officials who gave a readout of that um, of their meeting, and nor is it what he told Biden according to his own uh, readout. According to his own readout, he had actually um, uh, warned the President of the United States that not only did he expect the United States to not support independence movements in Taiwan, but to act actively support uh, the, the peaceful reunification of Taiwan. So this is a shift in, in language. He's up the stakes. He's done it directly to the US president. Uh, and in my view, he's setting uh, you know, something like a narrative trap where he positions the United States as the provocateur, the cause, the aggressor, um, if Xi Jinping decides um, that he, he, he cannot use peaceful means and, and resorts to kinetic means to take Taiwan. So that's an example, I think, of, of taking a little bit more care to read 
the messaging that comes from Beijing and this dual track messaging of internal guidance to the system and external guidance uh, to people like ourselves. Uh, the second example I wanted to mention, and it's topical, you both brought it up in your opening remarks, is, is TikTok. Now, you know, I think the, the capabilities of social media um, platforms are, you know, I think are reasonably well known, the ability to micro-target uh, constituencies, to, um, to change, to shape algorithms, to, to, um, to filter, to colour, to censor, to elevate, um, to shape narratives. You know, I think that capability is well known. But I think what's been missed is the intent that the party has communicated to use platforms like TikTok uh, to shape the international discourse as part of what Xi Jinping calls discourse power. Um, I'll just take you back to a couple of um, of important documents over the last decade. John, we might, ha we might have to tackle that in Q&A because we have a, if, uh, a five minute time limit that we're sure. over. Sorry, it's unfair, these procrastinian rules we put no, that's on good. you, but we, we'll have plenty of time in Q&A if you want to offer a final thought. Sure, um, uh, happy to. And that is to offer, offer the final thought that, um, that you know, the party you know, has an obsession with language, with discourse, um, and I think it's important to understand that whereas it might be dismissed in our system that words are kind of easily kind of seen as easy to give away, not very expensive, um, but I think for the Chinese political system, it's the primary target. You know, the discourse is the primary battlefield. It's if, uh, and I think the logic is, and this has been um, explained in, in many party documents, if you can shape the words and the language that people use, you can shape the, their perceptions and eventually you shape the way that they think and you shape their decision-making uh, capabilities. So I think that's really the important backdrop, ideological framing uh, for understanding, for framing this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And we all have your wonderful written, written statement as well. Dr. Yu, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Gallagher and uh, Ranking Member uh, Krishna Murthy and other August members of the committee. And I also uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the opportunity for me to. Okay. Should I start? Should we start? Oh, thank you, uh, Chairman and Gallagher and uh, uh, Ranking Member uh, Krishna Murthy and other August uh, members of the committee. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity for me to appear before you talk about the very important topic. Um, I do echo uh, uh, my co panelist's sentiment about the bipartisanship of uh, this uh, very important uh, committee. Uh, although you, are, you notice that I arrived late, so I blame that squarely on the Democrats because uh, President Biden decided to, uh, to light the Christmas tree uh, in the White House that created tremendous traffic jam in Washington, D.C. Uh, so uh, the term discourse. Uh, Make no mistake, the term discourse power for global community is what propaganda is for China domestically. Uh, propaganda is not a bad term in China. It's actually a positive term uh, that's not really um, carrying the uh, morally reprehensible uh, uh, meaning uh, involving false representation of truth. Rather, it's necessary, it's a virtue, uh, it's, it, it's a critical practice of governance. Uh, so uh, when you talk about the uh, uh, discourse power, uh, the literal translation is the right to speak, hua uh, yuquan. If you read the uh, French rebel philosopher uh, Michel Foucault, you might use uh, uh, something like a discourse power, a power of discourse. But if you understand the intent of the phrase of the Chinese Communist Party, it's a little bit misleading to translate just that way because uh, Xi Jinping's idea of discourse power means that he wants to have a, is part of the uh, party campaign of telling the China story well. Uh, and that basically is very important. That is, he does not want to just have China to have the right to present the story. He wants to dominate the dialogue. He wants to make the, uh, the CCP's propaganda about China the only global discourse about China Therefore, the correct translation, actually, uh, for me, uh, about Hua Yuquan should be discourse dominance. So I'm going to use uh, um, uh, in this uh, discussion um, in, the, in, in that context. Uh, so China's discourse dominance basically manifests itself in four ways. Number one is disinformation, uh, straightforward. They have basically several ways. One is to use tools of free expression to destroy uh, freedom. 
and they use uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, TikTok, uh, uh, you know, sort of a questionable there, uh, to, to spread the propaganda. In 2020 alone, Facebook had to shut down over 200,000 accounts, fake accounts, organized by China's uh, uh, propaganda uh, discourse power organizations. And they also uh, massively penetrated the international organization, infused some of the uh, communist uh, ideologies, concepts, into organs like the United Nations, uh, WTO, and the World Bank. Xi Jinping's uh, uh, community of common destiny for mankind, for example, is written in ruined resolutions. And as well as his uh, uh, phrase, Chinese uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. So this is a very, very sort of a conceptually uh, deceptive and very dangerous uh, aspect. Of course, the hardest hit community um, in um, overseas uh, are the Chinese diaspora community. The Chinese government, Chinese government control the Chinese diaspora in the following ways. Number one, they basically buy out all the major uh, media outlets. Of the hundreds of TV stations, newspapers, magazines overseas outside of China, uh, almost all of them are now bought by the Chinese Communist Party. There's a recent study uh, indicated that the, the only network that is not really com uh, controlled by the Chinese Communist Party is the Falun Gong-related media uh, outlets. And that's pretty telling. Think about this, right? So you have millions and millions of people. There are six million Chinese Americans alone in this area. And of course, there, there was a massive economic engagement with the United States. Amazon.com, for example, is very dangerous. Amazon.com has a total of 1.5 million sellers. Over two-thirds of them, 1.1 million of sellers were based in China. And they sell a lot of goods. Some of the, some of the uh, products were dominating and very dangerous. For example, if you go to Amazon, you spend $60, $60 to about $200. You can buy something called the Unblock. Unblock is manufactured by the China state-owned enterprise in China. What it did is, is a TV box. If you install that in many of the Chinese American home, you can change your viewing experience of TV every day, as if you were living in Beijing, Shanghai. You can view every single channel in China. And they say you can also get a free HBO, free Cinemax, but you got to navigate, make it very technically difficult to do that. But the default ones are Chinese uh, 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 information. So I hope the committee will look into the issues like that. It's, it's very dangerous. Virtually every Chinese community uh, has uh, saturated with, with this kind of uh, devices. Um, and of course, there is also the issue of WeChat. I mean, they use WeChat to, to control the communication between outside China and inside China, which is very dominating. So, Another way they do this uh, uh, discourse dominance uh, is, um, is through cultivation proxies. In the old days of Cold War, the Soviet Union expressed state uh, propaganda mostly by its own senior officials, ambassadors, scholars. They come to uh, American TV sta station. They go to uh, colleges to engage in seminars. Chinese Communist Party rarely does that. What they do is uh, they basically send their best China, uh, American scholars. They have more China, American scholars than we, do, we, we have China, uh, China scholars. They send them to Wall Street, K Street, and, um, and the think tank roads in uh, Massachusetts Avenue to cultivate the proxies. And they, those, those are very prominent figures. And they make them what they call the friend of China, FOC. Once you are foc and you become basically uh, 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 a captured elite working on behalf of the CCP. Uh, third method is that uh, self-censorship. This is uh, Hollywood and NBA, and uh, everybody who wants to do anything about China today, you have to really be mindful of the fact that everything you write, everything you say, every single email you send could hinder your opportunity to work and uh, study in China. That's why American has a major mood souring on China. Today, we have over 300,000 Chinese students, scholars studying in the United States. Do you know how many Americans study in China right now? 380. 380. No zeros after that. That's because it's very dangerous for Americans to, you go to the State Department travel uh, 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 page, there's a warning, travel warning, urging Americans do not go there. You can be arbitrarily arrested or detained, or even worse. So that's four. Number, number, five, number four is brainwashing. Brainwashing is a great enterprise conducted by the Chinese government. It's a long-term strategy. Confucius Institute is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we have talked about uh, extensively recently. Many of the prevailing concepts in American public discourse, such as the word progressive, such as the word uh, uh, consciousness raising in American uh, social movement, those words can trace its origin back to the Chinese Communist Party. 
Consciousness risen, for example, straight from the Yang'an era in the 1940s. Dr. So, Yu, we'll have, we'll have to uh, get to that in, in question. We're, we're over Okay, time. great. So I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have, I have a lot of brainwashing questions, so I'll, we'll get back. Uh, Ms. Wang, the floor is yours for five minutes. Chairman Gallagher, Ranking Member Krishna Morthy, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for convening this hearing on this important issue that the U.S. needs to address before the CCP's narratives take hold Amer among American public. This testimony draws on Freedom House's years of research on the CCP's global influence campaign. The good news is that in the realm of a global public opinion, the CCP is not succeeding. Pew research this year show that views of China are broadly ne negative across 24 countries it is surveyed. And the U.S. is viewed far more positive than China, especially in high-income countries. And within the U.S., a Gallup poll in March shows that a record low 15% of Americans view China favorably. Such growing negative views correspond with the CCP's worsening repression within the PRC and more aggressive activities abroad. It is also a result of investments in independent expertise, investigative journalism, and local laws protecting press freedom. This really attests to the high degree of resilience among democracies to Beijing's disinformation efforts. That being said, there's no indication that the CCP plans to rein in the, its operations. In fact, Freedom House and other organizations have all found that Beijing is not only spreading its disinformation across many more platforms, languages, and geographic audiences, it's also experimenting with tactics that are more sophisticated and hard, harder to detect. And so far, social media companies have been inconsistent in monitoring and taking down Chinese disinformation networks. And given the reach of social media platforms, and we should be especially vigilant about risks for CCP influence through them, below are three platforms that I think warrant special attention at the moment. Um, you know, my co-panelists have mentioned two of them. First is WeChat, uh, owned by the Chinese tech giant Tencent and heavily used among the Chinese di diaspora, which I am a member of. Uh, many first-generation Chinese outside the country rely on WeChat exclusively for information. Think about that, five million, many of the five million Chinese diaspora rely exclusively for information from WeChat. And research showed that overseas WeChat users face censorship and surveillance. And in August, the Canadian government disclosed a network on WeChat that engaged in a coordinated campaign to smear parliament member Michael Chong, who has been a vocal critic of Beijing. And uh, you know, when, when we say it's hard to evaluate the effectiveness of disinformation campaign, and I would say this is where it's actually quite effective. And most people don't know because most people are not in the Chinese diets where most people don't speak uh, the Chinese language. I mean, I'm very glad that today on the, you know, on the panel, two of us are from the Chinese diaspora. <laughs> the second um, platform that needs to be you know, paid special attention to is X, formerly Twitter, owned by Elon Musk. On its new leadership, X has dismantled many of the policies and teams that had increased the transparency and the throttled inauthentic behavior. Uh, in addition, Musk may be particularly vulnerable to pressure from Beijing because he has significant business interests in China, and the CCP is very, very good at leveraging foreign businesses' access to the country to compel them to toe the party line. Tesla, China is Tesla's second largest market, and Tesla's factory in Shanghai is the largest electrical vehicle factory in the world. And Musk's close relationship with the CCP was on display early this month during a meeting with Xi Jinping in San Francisco, in which he expressed gratitude to Xi for his support to Tesla's China operation, and he pledged to dive deep in China. And then lastly, we have all mentioned that, you know, it's obviously that's very important, is TikTok, which is owned by ByteDance. I can't emphasize enough the point that all Chinese companies, whether they are private or public, 
are subject to the control of the CCP, which creates an opportunity and a mechanism for Chinese government censorship, surveillance, and propaganda that affect not only their China-based users, but those around the world. Um, you know, when we talk about TikTok, there are always the arguments whether there's evidence or not evidence about propaganda censorship. This is beside the point. The point is that the, the CCP has the capability to do whatever it wants just by the nature of the relationship between Chinese business and the Chinese government. And there are evidence that TikTok has been found suppressing content critical of the Chinese government. And they, uh, TikTok has also been found to track journalists who are covering the company's link to China. So in this contest, Freedom House calls on Congress to, number one, enact regulations that require transparency from all social media platforms, including disclosure of their content moderation policies and enforcement and what content they have censored, suppressed, or promoted at the requests of governments. Secondly, hold a hearing to examine questions regarding Tencent's data protection and content moderation on WeChat as they relate to US-based users. Lastly, continue to provide funding to civil society initiatives around the world that are documenting and address Beijing's foreign media influence activities. Thank you, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Wang. Um, on to questions. Uh, Mr. Garno, your testimony, you talked about um, your uh, seminal piece, Engineers of the Soul, um, the Stalinist concept, and as Mao put it, the party's purpose is to ensure that literature and art fit well into the whole revolutionary machine as a component part, that they operate as powerful weapons for uniting and educating the people and for attacking and destroying the enemy. So how would a platform like TikTok with a black box algorithm fit into that CCP revolutionary machine? Well, we have a, an indication from how um, the party uh, works with which with WeChat. So, uh, you know, WeChat is a very censored um, uh, platform where where people can be sort of deplatformed uh, without even knowing they've been deplatformed. Um, the uh, very heavily censored and uh, and propaganda material is promoted all the time. I think TikTok is a more sophisticated um, capability where it has um, the ability, at least in theory, to, to micro-target messages to different constituencies in different parts of the world or different demographics. Uh, and it's got an algorithm which, which nobody has access to, but it's in China and the Chinese state has not allowed that algorithm to, um, to be sold or taken outside the United States. It's export controlled, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. So what we have is a combat is um, you know I'm not here to say that I've done the work to to analyze you know how with any confidence whether TikTok is distorting the information environment at the moment on any particular um, subject I think that's a you know that's a an empirical question to ask uh, but it's got that capability and by combining the capability that it has with the intent that we're talking about um, particularly when you go back to some of the the Politburo study sessions that, that Xi Jinping has hosted over the last 10 years about being able to use short videos to micro-target constituencies, I think you have the combination of capability and intent, which could be a formidable um, information uh, shaping tool. Well, let, let's dig a little bit into some of the data that we have from the Israel-Hamas war, which I fear is providing us a real-time case study of how one could engineer the soul of young Americans. Uh, this is gonna veer into some simple math, which is always dangerous for a Marine, uh, but bear with me for one minute, um, and we're gonna have some displays with this. Uh, there are roughly, here we go, uh, twice as many monthly active users on Instagram compared to TikTok. If you look at publicly accessible data, this ratio holds for when it comes to a lot of viral topics, or for example, there's about twice as many posts on Instagram as TikTok, uh, TikTok for Taylor Swift, the Barbie movie, Democrats, and Donald Trump for uh, uh, pop culture and political topics. But where it gets interesting, however, is if you start searching for topics that might be controversial for the CCP. For example, there are about five times as many posts with the hashtag Stand With Israel on Instagram compared to TikTok. 
suggesting that for whatever reason, pro-Israel content is underrepresented on the platform. And then the closer you get to topics the CCP disapproves of, the higher this ratio becomes. So it's a 12 times disparity for Stand With Ukraine. It's about nine times for uh, Uyghurs. It's about 30 times for Tibet. And it's 153 times for Tiananmen. To be fair, to be fair, the data do not on their own represent a smoking gun, but there's clearly a disparity in outcomes that can't be explained away. And by the way, th these are the metrics and the methodology that TikTok themselves pointed us to in mid-November when they faced accusations of rampant anti-Semitism on the platform. But Mr. Garno, could you describe how these trends might provide a window into what the CCP could do to leverage TikTok in the event of a Taiwan conflict or an American election that they may have a, an interest in, in shaping the outcome? Look, I think the potential for, for uh, you know, radically shaping the information environment, for, um, particularly for young uh, Americans, is enormous. So you can imagine uh, disinformation being channeled to particular constituencies on particular efforts, you, uh, on particular issues. You can imagine um, uh, the sorts of, of you know, reconstructed you know, fake uh, news and videos being channeled, uh, which might obscure, for example, the cause of a conflict over Taiwan. Um, so I think the ability of this platform to manipulate public opinion at crucial moments, and I think that's the key thing. It's not, I think it's interesting and important to look at what they're doing now, but it's the potential when uh, when China might decide that it really needs it, I think that's the issue for, for deep concern. Thank you. My time has expired. Mr. Chris Morthy is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd also like to ask a couple questions about TikTok. So just to level set everyone about TikTok, TikTok has 150 million American users, and an astounding number of Americans actually rely on TikTok for the, as their primary news source. One a statistic is that one-third of all Americans between the ages of 18 and 30 rely on TikTok as their primary news source. As everyone knows, TikTok, TikTok is owned by the PRC company called ByteDance. So Mr. Garneau, I just want to focus a little bit on ByteDance and its ties to the CCP. Sir, like other PRC-based companies, ByteDance itself has a CCP internal committee, correct? Oh, that's correct. And, and the secretary of that CCP committee is a gentleman named Zhang Fuping, right? That's correct. Um, can you throw up the visual for a second? We found this on the internet. Uh, this is Mr. Zhang on the right. He, he's not only the secretary of the CCP committee, he is the editor-in-chief of ByteDance and its vice president. And in that picture, he's standing next to the director of the CCP's domestic paramilitary force. Now, Mr. Zhang has said that ByteDance should, quote, transmit the correct political direction of the CCP into every business and product line, and that includes TikTok, right, Mr. Garneau? That's correct. And though TikTok says it does not influence or censor content on the CCP's behalf, it is ByteDance that ultimately controls TikTok's algorithm, right? That's right. And, and we know this because the CCP wants it to be that way. In 2020, when ByteDance was about to be forced to divest TikTok by the Trump administration, the CCP immediately placed export controls that stopped ByteDance from selling the algorithm to anyone. Isn't that right? That's correct. Let me, let me turn your attention to this issue of American data security in TikTok. Under Chinese law, ByteDance is required to share user data with the CCP as part of its intelligence gathering. TikTok's attempt to address these concerns is an initiative called Project Texas that firewalls, uh, attempts to firewall American user data. Now, TikTok claims it's independent from Beijing and will not share American data if asked, but Ms. Wang leaked audio from internal TikTok meetings show that ByteDance employees in China accessed American user data in 2021 after Project Texas started, right? Correct. And so regardless of what TikTok says, if ByteDance
can access American user data, and ByteDance is subject to CCP control, then ByteDance, regardless of what TikTok does, can fork over American user data to the CCP, right? That's correct. CCP access to TikTok data is not theoretical. In October 2022, ByteDance granted CCP regulators in-person access, in-person access to TikTok's back end, which hosts nearly all of TikTok's internal communications. Again, TikTok's claims of independence to me, Ms. Wong, appear to ring hollow in light of, this, of, light, in light of these facts. What do you think? That's very correct. Let me uh, also, I want to turn your attention to another social media app that some of us forgot about that was actually attempted to be acquired by another PRC-based uh, entity, and that was Grindr. In 2018, a PRC company bought this app, which is the world's largest online dating app for the LGBTQ community. But then in 2019, the US forced the Chinese company to divest Grindr. Why was that, Ms. Wang? The concern for the Chinese uh, government's access to the data on Grindr. And what kind of data was it and why was there a concern? It's a dating app. Of course, there are personal data on, uh, on the dating app. And also the main concern is the, you know, the, the employees work for the, uh, for the American government and other entities that That's could. right. Yeah, correct. There were officials of the American government who were, whose data was on the app. There were members of the military whose data was on the app. And there was a concern that they would be blackmailed potentially by the CCP if they got their hands on that data. Finally, let me just point you to this, which is that TikTok claims that its uh, location information can't be used to track user US data, I'm sorry, US users. However, isn't it true that ByteDance employees in China track down US journalists with this data? Correct. Thank you. Mr. Whitman is recognized by me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us today. Today's hearing is titled CCP Strategy to Shape the Global Information Space. I would argue that this is very much like what we term in, in the military, and that is shaping the battle space. I would argue that this is the information battle space. Ch China, the CCP, is all about shaping how, potentially, they can gain an advantage within that area. Ms. Wang, would you, would you say that China is indeed trying to shape this information battle space to their own advantage? Absolutely. And in doing that, they are using various social media platforms. You heard very eloquently about what they're doing with TikTok, but using other ways of shaping information to be able to influence the United States, be able to influence people within the United States to create sympathy towards the Chinese Communist Party. And in, in that realm, we know that efforts strategically to influence are really about limiting the freedom of action by your adversary, by slowing and shaping decisions by your adversary. So what you want to do is to gain an advantage with that. Would you say that China in their efforts through ByteDance and TikTok, and their other efforts to influence information, to shape that information battle space, do you think that they are having indeed an influence on slowing uh, decisions here, on making things more friendly to their viewpoints here within the American population? I think the results are varied. Uh, definitely it's working in the Chinese language space. Uh, you know, as Miles mentioned that China, the Chinese government or its uh, um, affiliated entities have bought so many newspapers and news uh, websites that are catered to the Chinese diaspora. And also, you know, WeChat is so widely used within the diaspora and it's, you know, it's the censorship and the surveillance is uh, quite severe. So it's quite effective within that uh, uh, space. Um, Outside of the Chinese language space, I feel you know the effectiveness uh, is not that obviously. Um, you know, I think that is due to the very vibrant, uh, uh, independent press 
um, in the U.S. There have been very good investigative journalism into CCP's disinformation. Uh, it's also because the U.S. government is, has paid a lot of attention. There has been funding from the US, U.S. government to doing research on this issue. I mean, our uh, Freedom Houses project, Beijing Global Media Influence, is funded by the uh, State Department. Uh, the fact that we are holding a he hearing today discussing this issue is a testament uh, that, you know, the disinformation campaign by Beijing is not working as well as it is. Uh, it hoped. But you do point out that their influence is growing, their ability to shape this information battle space, which is part of what they're doing around the world to gain an advantage, is getting, gaining some traction. In that realm, what would your suggestion be for this committee, and for that matter, our nation, to communicate the efforts that the CP, CCP is using to project propaganda, to essentially censor certain pieces of information through platforms like TikTok to be able to direct that. And also, not just in, in keeping information from going out, but actually putting out disinformation, which is even more nefarious than blocking information, as the chairman showed with those graphs. How do we go about explaining to the American people the emergence of this threat and then what we need to do to counter this threat? I think number one, really we need a law to force transparency by social media companies. Um, you know, we have all this speculation, there are some evidences about what TikTok is doing in terms of promoting CCP propaganda, cens censoring information that is critical of CCP. We don't know enough, we don't have the full picture because there isn't laws that are forcing social, company, social media companies to disclose that information. Uh, you know, we worry about uh, the data being accessed by the Chinese government. We can have laws to prevent that from happening. I think this would be a very effective and powerful uh, law to, you know, counter CCP disinformation. And secondly, I really wanted to go back to the Chinese language um, information space because this is really, you know, where the gov uh, the Beijing has made, you know, um, re uh, progress there. And, uh, I, you know, being the Chinese, a member of the Chinese diaspora, there's just so much disinformation. There just isn't the good in, uh, good in, uh, information in this language. I know so many Chinese people, they have circumvented the, the, the censorship. Um, uh, to read the news um, outside of the Chinese fire war, but they couldn't get the good information just because the whole whole space is so flooded by CCP's disinformation. So the Congress needs to investigate in the Chinese language uh, uh, space to provide the information that is accurate and fact-based. Um, you know, we have uh, the Voice of America, we have Radio Free Asia, but we need more. Uh, you know, uh, we need the kind of uh, information that actually speaks to the concerns of the community that, uh, you know, give information that they, they, uh, they, they want to hear. They need to hear. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You back, Ms. Castor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's it's clear that technology, the internet, and social media have evolved uh, very quickly, and the Chinese have used it to exploit and uh, exploit uh, it for their own ends in information warfare. So, Mr. Chairman, I really want to compliment you on on calling this important hearing, and I hope we have more on it. I think one of the things the Congress can do is shine a light on what is happening. Uh, but that's no substitute for, as Ms. Wang uh, recommends, uh, really adopting new laws. Uh, other countries have adopted online privacy laws, design codes, and things like that. Uh, and there's, there's simply no reason for the U.S. Congress not to have acted already. Dr. Dunn knows this very well in the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, last year, in the last Congress, we had a bipartisan bill on on privacy, online, uh, the American Data American Data Privacy and Protection Act. It passed out of committee. It never made it to the floor. This would be something that our committee, I hope, would focus on as we make recommendations to the standing committees to do that. Ms. Wang, is that the kind of recommendation when you say the Congress needs to act on, on privacy protection and transparency on algorithms uh, that, that needs to happen? Correct. I think there's a broad, um, you know, um, 
consensus among civil society organizations uh, who work on tech and democracy issues that we need a comprehensive data protection, uh, protection law, we need a transparency law to force social media companies to disclose the, this kind of information. I mean, you know, like TikTok, can tell the Congress, if Congress forced TikTok to tell in terms of their communication with the Chinese government, what kind of information they are censored, promote, you know, uh, within, um, within the U.S. So, uh, yes. And you highlight as well that, that these uh, big tech platforms are often designed to encourage constant user engagement and viral content, and that has particularly, it's, it has particular import on children because kids and young people are not, they haven't, their brains haven't developed uh, so that they can objectively understand what kind of propaganda and false information is pushed at them. So in addition to a privacy law, uh, the Congress has been slow to enact any kind of design standards, requirements uh, to say uh, that have put in place. States have acted. Uh, this would be another area that I would hope the committee could, would recommend uh, I've worked for, for many years with experts on the Kids Privacy Act to update, update the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. That needs to happen. There is a, uh, a bill moving in the Senate. It should be moving in the House too, COSA, that would, would uh, uh, put in place some design standards so that children are not constantly encouraged to be on their devices. These. I hope you all saw a recent Wall Street Journal expose. It's kind of getting a little off topic, but it shows how the online platforms are so motivated by profit that they're willing to allow sexual content, sexualizing of, of just searches. Of. This is something that, that we can tackle, and it would help. It would go a long way to empowering the American public to, to combat this information warfare, the constant propaganda that the Chinese Communist Party is going to press uh, at Americans and press and press on to young people. Ms. Wang, do you, other places have adopted design codes? Uh, is this also something that you would recommend that we, the Congress act on? I really, I can't speak on the children's issue because that's not within my expertise, but I would say, you know, in order to counter the Chinese government's disinformation, a transparency, a comprehensive transparency and data protection law would be very effective. Dr. Yu, do you agree? You said that, that uh, these Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, that have become much more systemic, sophisticated, dangerously effective. Do you agree that Congress should act on privacy and design, uh, design codes online? Well, Congress should make sure that uh, there is an issue of reciprocity. In other words, uh, if Twitter, Facebook uh, are banned in China, and we should demand some kind of reciprocity that uh, unless China really open up a, a, a market to our companies. Uh, how about, but the, in the how about transparency on these algorithms? We don't know. The average person has no idea. A child has no idea that they are being steered in a certain direction. That kind of transparency is important, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, privacy is always the major challenge in the age of information explosion right now, particularly social network. I will say one of the major uh, things that uh, the Congress should do is, uh, uh, I think you know, you're know, you doing in some, somewhere in that direction. That is, previously, we always, re, uh, the, the companies, uh, uh, they're dealing with China, there's a problem with China. So they view that as their company's problem with China. Uh, so they hire uh, the, uh, the, the, the lobbyists, uh, you know, people with access to China, Dr. Henry Kissinger, very prominent, to solve the problem for them. So they rarely contact the U.S. government. Uh, th so that's why Congress, uh, uh, Commerce Secretary Raimondo's visit to China recently is a very, very breakthrough uh, in the sense that in the, for, for the first time in many, many years, is the U.S. government cabinet secretary speaking on behalf of U.S. business in China. That's actually the pattern uh, uh, that, that you don't say that. So we should do more of that. Now, yes, uh, algorithm is very important. I, I think, uh, for example, TikTok. TikTok, you know, uh, the reason, uh, uh, there's danger. Uh, here's the, let me just talk about danger of this. If you go to China, you ask 10 people, what do you view about uh, Uyghurs? Nine of them will say they're terrorists. The reason that's the case because China has control not only information access, but also interpretation of information. 
So TikTok's major aim now is to grab the market as big as possible in the West so that when you, when you reach a critical dominant status, someday majority of people using, using uh, TikTok will say American de democracy is a failure. Chinese democracy is great. So that's ultimately, on a strategic level, that's the danger of that. So, uh, and so uh, I agree with, with uh, much of what my panelists have said. We're, we're out of time. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Lukemeyer. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chinese democracy, is that an oxymoron? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> thank you, sir. Dr. Yu, uh, appreciate your past comments there. I was kind of taken back by that um, Chinese democracy. Um, in your testimony, you stated that some foreign senior U.S. government officials have become registered agents for the Beijing regime and its CCP-controlled business interests in the U.S., which is extremely concerning. Would you like to elaborate a little bit further on that, give us some explanation on that? Uh, yes. Uh, as I said, China is very uh, keen on cultivating proxies. They, can use, they normally uh, use the people of a... Uh, 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 previous administration uh, positions. Uh, normally, for the, for the American, it's just a business opportunity. But for them, it's a, one of the ways to carry their message over there. Um, so let me, let me interrupt just a second here. So what, what's, the, what's the genesis behind doing this? What, what, what motivates an individual who is an American citizen, I assume? That's right. Uh, is it money? Uh, obviously, they don't understand perhaps the threat that China poses uh, what, for whatever they're trying to do, or... Are they just naive, or are they just, have they been turned to become Chinese supporters? No, they are going to convey the message that's very sophisticated and subtle, that the uh, average people is hard to, de to, to decipher. For example, one of the things uh, those uh, China brokers uh, would bring back from Beijing to the America, uh, public debate, always say, the U.S.-China relationship is the most important bilateral relationship in century. Uh, the reason the Chinese government wants you to believe that is because the Chinese government wants to be, want the world to believe all that matters in the world is China versus the United States, while in fact is China versus the rest of the world. That's a very subtle message to convey. So that's why China focuses on the United States, blame the United States for everything that's going wrong in the bilateral relationship. Forget the fact that the, virtually everybody um, in Asia Pacific has a China problem. Look at China's uh, neighbors. Everybody is afraid of them. Well, that's, that's, that's what concerns me is that everybody else can see that, this is, that they are bad actors out here in the world, yet how can some of our own people, unless they've turned against us, be willing to be advocates for and, and basically mercenaries for the Chinese government? That's right. Many of the people carry the come back to message with, this, uh, with the, uh, the central uh, theme that China is a normal country just like everybody else. We forget some of, the, some of the three major fundamental realities about China we don't, we don't normally mention. One, China is profoundly a non-market economy. And I, and I assume they are very Number two, China is a communist country. We don't, so a lot of people try to, uh, try to sort of uh, uh, downgrade the degree to which China is a communist country ruled by one, one party. Number three, China has a global ambition to, for dominance. So those people bring the message from Chinese leadership and say, oh, we're just a victim of, okay. of 100 years of, of humiliation, that sort of thing. So that's why it's very dangerous for them to Thank you for that. You can messenger. answer another question for me here, okay? Um, in 2020, the House Foreign Affairs Committee released a damning uh, statistic that said that since 2013, which is uh, about 10 years ago, the PRC has been the largest source of foreign donations to universities. Do you think this, and that number is about $6 billion, what I heard today. In another, in another meeting. Do you think this has any correlation to the anti-Semitic and pro-terrorism protests happening around college campuses today? In it's other words, is TikTok having an influence with all of the, the things that are going on and all the Chinese money that's going into these universities? Is it having an influence on our youth in the universities with regards to the anti-Semitism that we see, the pro-terrorist activities that we see? Absolutely. Uh, I, when I work in the Trump administration uh, at the State Department as a China policy advisor, uh, we uh, discovered that uh, the, just uh, uh, at the very preliminary uh, uh, survey, there was 1.3 billion Chinese dollars uh, poured into American universities, uh, unreported as required by law. And so that translated into a lot of uh, uh, influence. And many prominent universities, like Harvard University, for example, they conduct a survey on behalf of the Chinese government. 
to prove that 93% of Chinese people support the Chinese Communist Party. So use Harvard's prestige to support the Chinese propaganda. Harvard University really didn't really do that research. Harvard University subcontracted a Chinese firm based in Beijing to do that. So this is basically a disgrace. I mean, I think you know uh, you can see the Harvard administration's cowardice in the in the context of uh, Hamas atrocities. Uh, there, uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So um, I think Congress should adopt some kind of legislation more comprehensive to the term of 1947 uh, National Security uh, Act to mobilize the nation to deal with this, the preeminent threat posed by China. Uh, so that's why we cannot do it uh, piecemeal. We have to, uh, to do it holistically. In the old days, uh, there was a lot of immigrants from the communist world. Uh, that's why Congress have people like Tom Lantos, Democrats, and Solars, and, and, and many of you who understand the intrinsic logic of our threat. Okay. So that's why they can come up with some, some, of, the, some of the very uh, uh, effective uh, methods. Thomas Thomas Thank you, Dr. Hsu. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moulton is recognized. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, listening to <clears throat> our colleague Ms. Castor's um, impassioned case for, uh, for our inaction, how there's so much more that we could do, uh, reminds me a little bit of how we did react after the attacks on 9-11. Mr. Chairman, you and I are both veterans of the the war on terror. And as a nation, we enacted extensive defensive measures to protect our citizens from the type of terrorist attack that we saw on 9-11. And the safety of Americans since 9-11 has been in part because of those defensive measures, not for lack of trying by, the, by our adversaries. But today, China is attacking our businesses, our citizens, our kids, through the internet every single day, China is on offense and we have done nothing, nothing in defense. I can make a strong argument for why we should be on the offense ourselves, to spread democracy, freedom, Western values, and perhaps even act in the name of deterrence. But in the meantime, we've really failed to act. We're not doing anything and our congressional inaction is leaving our kids and our families defenseless from Chinese manipulation on the social media they rely on every day. Now another place where we know China is acting is to interfere in elections. And looking to Australia, China seems to have viewed Australia as a taste test case for undermining democracy. Mr. Garneau, you noted in your testimony that the Australian government had determined as early as 2017 that Chinese operations were focused on, quote, all levels of government and designed to gain access and influence over policy making. What did China do to interfere, and what tactics did the Chinese Communist Party employ? Um, so the report itself was was classified, but I can talk from open sources that um that the uh, that the Chinese government was working to um, uh, it had co-opted Chinese language media for a start. Um, it was using uh, business people, I think, as access to politics and for funding politics. I'll just speak in, in general terms uh, at the moment. Uh, and it was um, finding ways to transmit threats to uh, people in Australia, particularly in the Chinese uh, community, to change the way that they behave, particularly the way they engaged in or didn't engage in political uh, conversation. Uh, and they, there was also a lot of effort to, um, to through deceptive means, tap into our research uh, institutions in Australia. And my understanding is that Australian politicians came together quite aggressively and decisively to take action, to establish laws. How did that happen? How did Australian politicians come together to do that so effective, uh, so quickly, and what was most effective? Uh, there was there were a couple of elements. One, there was some I think really courageous and important pieces of investigative journalism. Uh, so so acts of um, uh, there were some some very prominent uh, media exposés of politicians taking uh, money from uh, people that seemed to be Chinese proxies, and that money was linked to statements uh, changing or challenging party line, um, Australian government lines on the South China Sea, for example. Uh, 
the work that I was doing, there was very important collaboration between the linking what could be seen and understood in the open source world, uh, working with the intelligence agencies. Um, and I can't comment on the content of that report, but the Prime Minister at the time, Malcolm Turnbull, said that that report and the investigations that um, informed it were galvanising uh, for Canberra at the time. And so, there so was bringing an this back home to, to America, DNI's 2023 annual threat assessment found that China is already meddling in our elections, including at the local level. This isn't a problem for us to address later. It's happening here and now. So Ms. Wang, in light of that clear and present danger, how can Congress act now to protect our democratic institutions from these threats? Can you be more specific for uh, the, the, the kind of threats you're talking about? The same thing that we're seeing from China and Australia that we just discussed. Um, in terms of uh, um, interfering with uh, in, within um, American political process, I think I mean goes back to you know, uh, you know social media is a it, it is a major way, and it goes back to uh, you know enacting laws to force companies uh, Chinese social media companies disclose the uh, you know kind of content they are pushing on behalf of, uh, of CCP, and uh, the U.S. government can definitely do that. We are all having all these discussions of what the, you know, the Chinese government is doing, tries to do. I mean, we can have a full picture if we have a law to force that to happen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Yu, you mentioned the National Basketball Association, so I want to ask you about that. I represent the University of Kentucky. There are currently 26 Kentucky Wildcats and the National Basketball Association. So I count myself as one of the 2.2 billion uh, NBA fans worldwide. And with 210 million followers across social media platforms, NBA social media platforms, the NBA is arguably the most popular sports league in the world. But the NBA is big business in China. NBA playoffs broadcast on state-run TV in China, and the NBA derives $5 billion from China every year. ESPN examined investments of the 40 principal owners of the NBA and found that they collectively have more than $10 billion tied up in China, including one owner whose company has a joint venture with an entity that has actually been sanctioned by the U.S. government. Now, I think on the one hand, exporting American basketball into China could be quite advantageous in the cultural competition that we have. On the other hand, because NBA players and owners uh, have so much of a financial stake in, in China, I worry that it is uh, a risk, and we saw this with LeBron James on full display, criticizing the, the Houston Rockets general manager uh, for actually defending pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. Talk to me about the NBA, uh, China's influence over the NBA, what risks there are, and does Congress have a role in helping the NBA see the light? That's a very good question, Congressman, and I'm a big fan of uh, Kentucky, uh, Kentucky Wildcats myself. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, U.S.-China relationship should never just be bilateral relationship between governments. There is a trilateral side of that, too. That is between American people and Chinese people. Chinese people, just like everybody else, love the NBA, love basketball. And uh, so there's a huge market. That should be normal. The problem is Chinese government control all the access of civil engagement. So that's the problem. Uh, so you have to really make sure that uh, there is a, some kind of legislature that will guarantee Americans equal access to Chinese market without the Chinese government unlawful interference on issues such as a tweet by a basketball manager and that will cause the complete suspension of the entire broadcast business. That is not only immoral but also should be illegal in some way. You can find some kind of legislature to do that. So that's why I think I had to use the word, well, I'm not going to say this, but I think it is very important for us to, to engage, uh, to basically deal with the Chinese government, not just uh, to believe that China only is represented by the Chinese Communist Party. And that's a very important dis uh, distinction. Uh, I mentioned that I have some government experience uh, working gov uh, previously. Uh, the single most violent reaction from the Chinese Communist Party is uh, uh, American statement. Uh, that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is not the same as Chinese people. That drives them crazy, nuts. 
because that's the biggest fear. And in their fear, the Chinese people would identify with American values and principles, including our passion for basketball. Well, we, want, we want the Chinese people to love American basketball, but not the CCP. That's exactly. Particularly uh, Kentucky Wildcats. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, go Cats. Thank you. Uh, TikTok, real quick. Last, last year, TikTok was, uh, was second only to YouTube as the most used social media platform by American teenagers. A third of TikTok's adult U.S. users got their news from the platform in 2022. Um, a billion monthly active users, eight new users every second. Uh, I am worried about TikTok's selective promotion of certain topics uh, and narratives to curate a CCP-friendly political landscape. We hear about proposals to ban TikTok, to uh, force a divestiture so that there's an American-controlled TikTok. What is the policy solution? My recommendation would be this. Um, I think uh, right now, um the biggest problem is that uh, we treat China uh, uh, subconsciously as if it's just another competitor in economic trade and even military sense. We fundamentally disagree on political issues, systems, so uh, unless we solve that problem, this, con this problem is gonna continue with TikTok and many other things. So I would recommend that uh, uh, Congress will enact some kind of law that identifies China as a non-market economy, as Chinese government, as anti-market, uh, as anti-business. So every business from China, TikTok included, who wants to do business with the United States, we have to place a burden of proof on them to prove the Chinese government would not have any interference in their operation in the United States. If we find that they violated that kind of pledge, their own pledge, as they said they're willing to do, and then we kick them out. So that's basically very simple. We, we place a burden of proof on their shoulder rather than we try to catch them. Because you know, uh, they can always play games. TikTok, for example, uh, uh, you guys said, you know, uh, uh, listen, you, you, you kind of have a server inside China. You said, well, move the server to Singapore and to, to Texas. But the problem is, is access, as the Congressman Gallagher said. Chinese Communist Party has full access to their servers, no matter where it serves. So that's the problem. Thank you, Yield. Ms. Cheryl. Thank you. Um, over the past decade, the Chinese Communist Party's aggressively adopted and funded a worldwide propaganda campaign, as we've heard tonight, to boost the image of President Xi and the CCP and denigrate the democratic world. In 2016, President Xi announced that, quote, the party's media must reflect the party's will and safeguard the party's authority. And today, the CCP has significant influence over key source of information for millions of Americans through TikTok. The CCP exports anti-US content to billions of people across the globe through print and digital media, such as through inauthentic social media accounts tied to CCP state-owned media agencies in Latin America and South Asia. And the CCP uses the economic power of the Chinese market to build self-censorship, as we were discussing right here in the United States. So it's long past time that Congress addresses the CCP's misinformation and propaganda efforts before it's too late. We have to take steps to ensure that key media sources aren't controlled by a hostile foreign actor, that free and fair media coverage reaches billions of people worldwide, and that Americans at home aren't fearful of the consequences of speaking out against CCP abuses. So doctor, you first, may I compliment you on your teaching at my alma mater, which is now evidently offering us uh, more robust course selections, uh, which is nice to hear than when I was there. Um, but FBI Director Christopher Wray told the Senate Intelligence Committee earlier this year that the CCP could use TikTok to shape public opinion in the United States in the event of a U.S.-China conflict, such as the potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Given significant usage of TikTok by young people in particular, this type of media control by a foreign government could dramatically impact how a conflict is perceived here at home. In fact, I think many of us suspect that that is happening right now. So if the U.S. and China were to enter into direct conflict, to what extent do you think the CCP would use TikTok to advance its propaganda and censorship goals? Well, first of all, go Navy. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I was also take this opportunity to remind my uh, 2014 class uh, midshipmen uh, in my capstone, um, capstone, um, capstone seminar. Papers are due Tuesday, 
by no, no exception. Uh, <laughs> During Army Week, wow, you're a tough professor. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the Taiwan scenario obviously is on everybody's mind, particularly uh, in this part of the, of the world. Uh, that's because the defense of Taiwan is not just about the defense of Taiwan per se. Uh, Taiwan is China's Sudetenland, if those of you who know history. China is never going to stop at Taiwan. After Taiwan, if Taiwan uh, is taken by China, it's going to go after uh, uh, Japanese and Kakus and Vietnamese uh, and the Indian territories, the entire South China Sea. So it's a very important for us to realize the, uh, the seriousness of the Taiwan scenario. If we don't stop the CCP at Taiwan, the world is going to be aflame. So that's the, that's the issue. Now, you asked a question about how a specific company is going to uh, uh, play a role in this Taiwan scenario. Uh, the honest answer is I don't know, but I, I do know this. There is a larger, there's a larger argument right now. The debate, global debate about Taiwan, defense Taiwan, is fundamentally different from the debate about Taiwan status uh, uh, in the 1970s, 80s. In those days, the issue was purely about sovereignty. Is Taiwan part of China, right? This is Taiwan, uh, is the province of China, or Taiwan has still maintained its, uh, its uh, uh, status as a Republic of China. Nowadays, global dialogue has shifted to not just away from that sovereignty uh, uh, concern, to one about freedom versus dictatorship. Taiwan is a shining democracy, and you have to so defend Taiwan is, is, is something far more important than just, uh, just the, whether Taiwan belongs to China or not. So that's where the uh, apps like TikTok will play in, because they might say, hey, listen, well, I'm going to maximize the dialogue about the sovereignty issue, whether Taiwan is part of China or not, mm -hmm. to dominate the international um, opinion space on that issue alone. You know, uh, to avoid the discussion about the fundamental political, ideological, uh, lifestyle right. differences. And to totally like shape the narrative of it. Absolutely, absolutely. There, and, and also, I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you if a war uh, breaks out, uh, uh, you know. Uh, that they'll first use that. I just want to get quickly before my time expires to Ms. Wang and talking about um, what we saw with the Houston Rockets. It clearly shows the power of the CCP in fa forcing domestic U.S. self censorship. How how, in your experience, how prevalent is this type of self-censorship by major U.S. leagues, movie studios, and corporations here in the United States? It's very, very pervasive. I mean, give an example of the Hollywood. I mean, you can think about any blockbuster you watched in the past 10 years have portrayed China in a, or the Chinese government in a negative light. I don't think we can come up with anyone because to any Hollywood producers, when they think about moving, making a movie, their first thing that goes to their mind is that I need to make sure this movie can be sold in China because that's a huge market. In some ways, and it's even bigger than the U.S. because of the population. So when this is something they are thinking about first, of course, I mean, the result is that they are not go going to produce anything that is going to portray you know, Beijing in an active light. So uh, this problem is very, very pervasive. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Newhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Wang, Dr. Yu, uh, Mr. Garneau, oh, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate your insight on this, this uh, another one of these topics that keeps, keeps all of us up at night. Uh, to me, based on what we've heard from you and what we've read, uh, it seems to come down to a battle of stories. Uh, whose story is more convincing? Uh, I, for one, firmly believe that our story, the U.S. story, and, and, and our model for freedom and, do, and democracy should and will prevail. Uh, we established the post-World War II rules-based order to prevent war, safeguard human rights, and uphold international law. The CCP has fundamentally undermined these institutions over the past years and decades. And this committee, Mr. Chairman, will continue to fight for the American story and, and its quest for sustaining perpetual peace. It leads me to my question for any and all of you. Uh, where has our government, currently the Biden administration, come up short in addressing the discourse power of the CCP? You know, I believe the administration 
you know, should not decide what is true. That's for the American people to decide. But how do we use the tools that we have? I mean, the, the Global Engagement Center at Department of State, the U.S. Agency for Global Media, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure uh, Security Agency at DHS, or, or something else. How, how do we use those tools while still respecting the First Amendment uh, and freedom of speech in the United States? We, we saw, I remind you of the disaster of the disinformation governance board that was tried by this administration that was shut down after just a few short weeks due to public outcry. So it's a fine line. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we address this. Okay, so uh, that's a very, very good question. Uh, somebody said uh, a nation is not conquered until it destroys itself. Uh, we, uh, we have this culture right now, which is uh, pretty uh, pernicious in my view, uh, of self-denunciation. We look at our uh, inadequacies as if this is systemic, this is really rooted in our, uh, uh, in our uh, fundamentals. That's not the case. Uh, the Chinese people know this. Uh, the most powerful person in China uh, is not Xi Jinping, is the visa officer of, in the U.S. consulate. Mm. Everyone wants to come to the United States. In this country, is a shining beacon of freedom. Each year, we grant, uh, each year, U.S. granted 270,000 asylees freedom. The next biggest one, we're the biggest one, next one is Germany, is one-tenth of that number. Mm. So people know, they vote with their feet. So we have no reason to doubt ourselves, the fundamentals. Our country is not perfect. There's a lot of uh, uh, inadequacies, but we constantly improve ourselves. So, uh, so I think that, first of all, we should have our self-confidence in ourselves. Um, that's number one, to start with. Um, and the Chinese government take advantage of that democratic discourse. And they always take one side of the discourse uh, to maximize it as if this is basically 100% of opinion. The United States is always a 50-50. So, for example, the Chinese government spokesperson always um, use, take, uh, take advantage of the tragic death of George Floyd, for example to constantly talk about the Americans' uh, systemic racism, while the government itself is conducting genocide against their own minorities. Hundreds of millions of people were, were, were not free to even make comments on those kind of things. So that's why you see uh, the narrative is right. In the old days, we have a government information agency called the Info US Info USIA. It's a centralized effort to not propaganda. Uh, it's just to basically to, to spread the uh, the, the, the ideas of American democracy, people will listen. So I think you know, we should really enhance our uh, broadcasting service and our government uh, uh, information service. Uh, okay. uh, just don't be shy about ourselves. That's what okay. I'm saying. Thank you. Any thoughts from you, Mr. Gallo or, or Ms. Wang? I just wanted to really concur with uh, Dr. Yu. Uh, I have friends who just recently uh, arrived in America from China and they participated in some protests in Washington DC. I don't remember what protest it is. And he told me, I'm so inspired, I'm so empowered that you can just go to the street to voice whatever you think. And just hearing this person who just arrived in America and for the first time experienced a big protest, whatever the cause is, he just felt, you know, the sense of the rights you have, the sense of you know empowerment, sense of in a community of you know voicing an opinion uh, so freely is you know it's touched him, and uh, you know he instantly loved this country just because of this thing that he experienced. So you know just to concur, uh, Dr. Yu, you know stay free. This is the biggest thing thing to show to the Chinese people, you know, here is how we live. And this is appealing in itself because I feel, you know, the desire for freedom is innate. It's in every individual on earth. Thank you. Thank you. Freedom Thank is the victor, as we say. Ms. Rockenklaas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's clear that we have to be both on offense and defense in this information contest and that the most urgent domain to play defense in is, is with TikTok. Uh, because freedom of speech is not the same thing as license of reach. You can post whatever you want on TikTok, regardless of how noxious it is, without having to fear for reprisal from Congress, but that does not mean that individuals have a right to have their posts viewed by 100 million people or that the American body politic needs to allow a foreign adversary to control the algorithm that determines that reach. It seems clear that we need to have in place regulations uh, to gain back control over this uh, 
this information technology. To that end, Senator Warner uh, has led a bipartisan effort in the Senate with the support of the White House to uh, introduce legislation called the Restrict Act. And the Restrict Act uh, puts in place a risk-based process at the Department of Commerce to identify and mitigate foreign threats to information and communications technology products and services uh, with his premise being that before TikTok it was Huawei or, uh, or other ICT technologies that were the cause of concern for surveillance or information operations and that instead of playing whack-a-mole we need to always just have a, 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 an agency and a process in place to determine if they have to be uh, forcibly sold or even uh, banned. I'd be interested for thoughts from any of you about whether the Restrict Act would be a good path forward either now or in writing afterwards. I, we can we can do it in writing afterwards then. I, but I would I would welcome thoughts from uh, from any or all of the three of you on that act and that legislation in particular. Um, I want to turn now to going on offense, uh, and I really want to echo Dr. Yu what you said. Um, we have a great story to tell, and we need to move past this uh, this fashion of of constant self denunciation and recognize the inherent goodness and greatness of this country. Uh, and to tell a story of free speech, free enterprise, and representative government everywhere in the world. Uh, and I want to focus on three countries in particular that I think of outsized importance there, and I want to get your opinions on how you think we're doing in those three countries. Uh, the first, and I'll start with you, Mr. Garneau, would be Indonesia, which is a country that my understanding is the elites within Indonesia are relatively pro-CCP, uh, and yet that country is a Muslim-majority country, and it's surprising to me that they're <laughs> They're, they're so uh, solidly in support of a country that is engaging in, in uh, crimes against humanity of a Muslim minority population. Talk to me about how we're doing in, with the American story in Indonesia. Uh, look, I don't think it's a correct um, representation to say that Indonesian leaders are pro-CCP. They've resisted, for example, signing up to the BRICS um, organization. I think it's a mixed uh, picture. In Indonesia, I don't detect a lot of you know, pro-Beijing sentiment, but there's always a risk of of, uh, of co-option, uh, and and there is um, I think also the the Israel um, Hamas conflict is very divisive in the in the um, Islamic world as well. How how is the United States doing in terms of supporting local news outlets or otherwise telling our story in Indonesia? Uh, look. It's a little bit beyond my expertise, but I, I, I don't think that democratic governments anywhere are doing a good job of telling their stories um, in ways that are palatable All right, in Ms. other countries. Ms. Wang, I would turn to you. You can, you can touch on Indonesia if you'd like to, but also if you, um, if you could, Nigeria, which by 2050 will be the third biggest country in the world, which has half of its population under the age of 18 and which is already a cultural dynamo for tech and media. Uh, and is, is sort of, an, uh, to me, a, a, an open contest for information operations between CCP and the United States. How are things going in Nigeria? Thank you for mentioning Nigeria because um, Freedom House's Be uh, Beijing Global Media Pro uh, Influence Project uh, uh, did an extensive survey in 30 countries and among the 16 countries, among the 30 countries, 16 countries were identified are uh, on the, uh, you know, under Beijing's influence, we identify as very high or very high, and I think Nigeria is one of the highest that is under Beijing's influence, which means that Beijing's disinformation campaign is quite effective there. Um, in terms of what, how the U.S. is doing in Indonesia, actually, you know, uh, the, our project, uh, the Beijing Global um, Media Influence Project, is funded by State Department. So one of the things that under our project we did is to, uh, did uh, in a study in Indonesia, also support local Indonesia civil society journalists um, in their independent reporting. So, I mean, our grant, was, uh, it was from the State Department. So, I mean, the State Department, the U.S. government is doing something uh, to, you know, boost to the, the civil society space, the independent journalism in those countries to counter uh, Beijing's uh, in disinformation influence. But of course, I think the U.S. government can do much more than uh, it has been doing. Yield back. Dr. Dunn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank 
our illustrious panel for your service, uh, informing the free world of this, uh, uh, your, your expertise is very appreciated. I'd like to begin with a brief conclusion found in the State Department's recently released special report entitled, How People's Republic of China Seeks to Reshape the Global Information Environment. Part of the report concludes Beijing uses false or biased information to promote positive views of the PRC, the CCP, and the PRC, this is in quotes, the PRC seeks to cultivate and uphold a global incentive structure that encourages foreign governments and foreign elites, journalists, civil and civil society to accept its preferred narratives and avoid criticizing any of the CCP's conduct. Uh, we know the CCP leverages their three warfares. We've discussed that. Thank you for your clar clarity on that. Uh, focusing on manipulating public opinion, legal warfare, and psychological warfare to gain economic leverage and international recognition. Back in March, the ENC committee, which I also sit on, invited Mr. Chu, the CEO of TikTok, to testify before us. I was troubled by Mr. Chu's boast of 150 million American users and uh, a very bipartisan group of congressional colleagues is working together to protect Americans from this uh, Chinese-owned app. Uh, separate from the data breaches and privacy concerns we have with TikTok, the sheer volume of CCP propaganda and promotion of anti-democratic values fits squarely within the CCP's multi-pronged warfare strategy, and their content is relentlessly pro-CCP. In fact, any TikTok data that is viewed, stored, or, pa or you know, passes through China briefly is subject to the laws of the PRC. And their court system, of course, reports uh, to and falls under the control of the CCP. I ask Mr. Chu directly if TikTok was spying on Americans, and he first denied it. Uh, upon being confronted with proof of that, he attempted to redefine the word spying. <laughs> uh, but we know that answer, and, and in fact, a 2021 report by Lithuania's National Cybersecurity uh, Center outlines you know, all the risks and problems with that. Uh, and it outlined how the privacy of European users are violated in clear cases of uh, unauthorized collection of data. Worse, show me phones, that's uh, another one, sold to Europeans had a list of 449 words and phrases which would be automatically censored on their device. Uh, and, and these phrases included things like long live Taiwan and, and de democratic movement. Uh, uh, the analysis was conducted on devices which had been manufactured and sold to Europeans during Mr. Chu's time as the C chief of operations for Show Me. Uh, obviously, we wonder what TikTok is doing under the same leadership. Uh, Mr. Garneau, uh, you, see, uh, you succinctly warned of the influence of TikTok, uh, citing how ByteDance's de development journey followed Xi Jinping's offer to meticulously build an external discourse medicine, mechanism and uh, utilize the role of existing emerging media. A quote from Xi himself said, to, this is told to a study session of China's Politburo. Can you, know, can you expand on the risk of TikTok to the Western users? Mr. Gardner. Could you? I just couldn't hear the last part of your question. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I was asking. You know, it's, uh, you know obviously TikTok. <laughs> you just, can you just? Do you have a, a sound bite on how we've with? 40 seconds left. Do you have a soundbite on how uh, uh, TikTok is, is a risk to American users? I think the primary risk of TikTok controlled effectively by Beijing is it can shape the narratives, it can elevate favorable opinions and suppress others in a way that could be decisive. It could, it could um, influence public opinion at decisive moments in really important and dangerous ways. Thank you so much. You know, uh, with 12 seconds left, let me just take a moment to, to thank the expert witnesses that we have here tonight for courageously 
sharing your insights with us uh, and, and also for your very cogent answers. You're, you're an unusually erudite and, uh, and polite group to work with, I, I, a productive group to work with. Uh, thank you very much. And Mr. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When it comes to the struggle to win the hearts and minds of the international community, particularly the Global South, China seems to have a natural advantage over the United States. China has an authoritarian message that resonates naturally with authoritarian regimes. Right? China can easily tell those regimes, unlike the United States, we, the CCP, will never sit in judgment of you. America will come to you and give you a lecture. We will come to you and give you infrastructure. And tragically, we live in a world where there are more autocracies and democracies, and those autocracies seem ideologically predisposed to buy what China is selling. So Mr. Garnot, what can the U.S. do to overcome the appeal of China's autocratic messaging to autocratic regimes? Uh, this is a real challenge, uh, China's ability to uh, co-opt elites. I think that is um, the fundamental problem here. And in my view, the most important thing is to uh, illuminate um, uh, improper financial dealings uh, and to the extent that that's possible to cut off the grey income flows to elites in countries where institutions are not robust. Uh, if you cut off the bribery, um, then I think um, uh, Beijing would be less popular in many countries. You know, China's known for exercising both discourse power and economic coercion, and these two seem to be mutually reinforcing. So take a, a recent example is Elon Musk, who owns and operates X, formerly known as Twitter, and who has considerable business interest in China. In a recent interview with Andrew Ross Sarkin of the New York Times, Mr. Musk had colorful language for advertisers fleeing his social media platform X. Without quoting him verbatim, he essentially told his advertisers to go to hell. Ms. Wang, do you think Musk would deliver the same kind of tough talk to the CCP? Well, I mean, a good uh, anecdote or evidence that he wouldn't is that, I mean, uh, Elon Musk tweets constantly when he's in the U.S., right? But when he visited in China earlier this year, he was completely silent for, I think, at least like a day or two when he was in China because Twitter is banned uh, in China. So he's apparently complying with Chinese laws, um, you know, complying with Chinese practice of not accessing Twitter. Um, I mean, uh, Elon Musk has, uh, you know, publicly said he thinks that Taiwan should be part of China. So there are rhetorics um, um, that clearly shows, I mean, he you know, ideologically align with uh, the CCP. Um, and, and also- And Mr. Musk also said that he is committed to core socialist values. Do you think he's actually committed to core socialist values or does he feel coerced by the economic and discourse power of the CCP? Well, I think the economics definitely, I mean, in the back of him, his mind just because of the, the huge interests he has in China. And, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of uh, companies have interesting um, in the U.S., uh, Chinese company or American companies. But the, the American government doesn't, uh, you know, coerce or leverage that for um, foreign companies' access to the U.S. government. American government doesn't even have the power um, to, to, you know, tie political uh, uh, goals uh, to business access. But the Chinese government can do that. So that's a very powerful tool to compel foreign companies to do that. I mean, Elon Musk had, you know, Tesla, sec China is Tesla's second market, and Tesla's Shanghai factory is the, wor the world's largest electric fa uh, factory. Uh, Dr. Yu, I found myself struck by the following statement in your testimony, quote, the propagandists determined to undermine America's confidence are aided and abetted by our country's self-denunciation, from opinion-setting editorial boards to opinion-forming classrooms that only see vice in the world's oldest continuous democracy but ignore systemic and inherent goodness at its core, eloquently put. Um, I share the view that there seems to be an American culture of self-loathing spreading virally on social media platforms and college campuses. And it's hard to imagine more compelling evidence of America's cultural self-loathing than the trending of Osama bin Laden's letter to America on TikTok. Uh, do, do you agree with that assessment? I agree. I think, you know, uh, Oh, one reason I said that, uh, um, the way you read it actually sounds much better than <laughs> I wrote it. Uh, yeah, so um, let me just put it this way. 
Uh, I'm happy to read more of when, your testimony. When, when Americans criticize our government, that shows our sense of responsibility. We wish this country to be a more perfect union, right? That's what I, what I think. Uh, when the Chinese Communist government criticize us, they want us destroyed. Because it doesn't matter which party is in charge. Democrats or Republican is not a policy per se. It's the very existence of the United States that could inspire Chinese people. Uh, that's what they fear about most. So that's why I think you know, um, we should have self-confidence in ourselves um, and, and uh, to believe that the, the virtue of our democratic system is infinitely better uh, than anything the Chinese Communist Party could, could offer. Back to the question you were asking just a little bit earlier uh, within, in 20 seconds. Ultimately, the Chinese model of governance would not prevail. You look at even Chinese American companies, how many of them are going in? No. Yes, Elon Musk is there, but a majority of the companies were already getting out. Showing up at, the, at this subsequent dinner in Silicon Valley for Xi Jinping uh, are those people who already have their investment in China, but people who, were not, who did not show up are the CEOs of Google, Facebook, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and AMD. Many companies didn't, didn't do that because they know China is not a very good uh, environment for them to invest. As uh, Secretary of Commerce Romano said, China essentially is uninvestable. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Banks. Dr. Yu, you played a leading role in the Trump administration's efforts to counter communist China. I'm just curious, yes or no, do you think those efforts were motivated by anti-Chinese or anti-Asian race racism of any sort? Absolutely not. Okay, I didn't think so either. In 2020, I raised serious issues concerning Yubin Meng, then the chief investment officer of CalPERS, America's largest state pension fund, for being a part of China's so-called Thousand Talents espionage program and for having, a, having worked at a Chinese government agency. I was immediately called a racist uh, for calling attention to this issue. Historian Neil Ferguson, who I, I generally like and respect, I've read a lot of what he's written, claimed that I was trying to, quote, have a go at a Chinese-born U.S. citizen. Dan Premack of Axios said that I was engaged in a, quote, red scare. The Cowper CEO called my letter a, quote, racist attack on an Asian American. And then several other figures on Wall Street piled on and said similar things. In 2015, Yubin Meng has said that, quote, the opportunity to work for the motherland was a responsibility and honor unmatched by anything. He even admitted that, quote, of course it empowers the Chinese regime to have the money flowing in from CalPERS, the state pension program, where he was the chief investment officer tasked with deciding where those investments go. But apparently you have to be a racist to suggest that this guy might not have America's best interest or the best interest of the Californian retirees whose pension funds he was investing uh, probably not have their best interest at heart. I, I was proven right in the end. Meng had not only directed billions of Californian retiree savings to businesses tied to the Chinese military, he soon resigned after a drawn-out investigation made clear that he had steered those investments toward Chinese companies that he held shares in. A few months later, when a Democrat colleague and I introduced a resolution condemning the Chinese government for its negligence in the COVID outbreak, progressives like Congresswoman Judy Chu immediately attacked us for putting Asian Americans, quote, at risk. So Dr. Yu, my question is, the CCP obviously benefits from the false narrative which equates tough on China policies with anti-Asian racism. Do you think that the CCP intentionally promotes that narrative and doesn't it play right into their hands? Let me put it this way. There is a movement called uh, anti-Asian hate uh, uh, in this country. Uh, I've been drafted uh, to, uh, to join in. I refused because uh, there are always ignorant people anywhere in the world. They have uh, uh, innate biases uh, because of, because of uh, education, because of their parochial view of the environment. So uh, those are people everywhere universal. But the fundamentally, the fundamental system of this country, the people, the, 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 uh, the idea that this republic was born with, that is the all men are created equal, created nothing but 
Asian love for people like my background. For those people who call any Chinese American or any other Asian American, any other ethnic groups who aspire to be free and democratic, uh, uh, some kind of you know Uncle Tom or some other bad names uh, uh, is absolutely racist itself because it assumes that people from different background who are only care about their ethnic identity, there's no political aspiration to be free like every other human being, and uh, that is really insulting to a lot of people. Hundreds of millions of people in China do not think of themselves not just a Chinese person, not just like, like Tibetans or Uyghurs or other ethnic uh, or other Christians. They think of themselves as a person, as an individual. Every individual should have their innate rights to be free and democratic. So that's why I think those people who were or uh, was very trigger happy to label anybody who disagreed with them from different background as, uh, as some kind of a, 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 has some racial motivation is absolutely nonsense. I can testify to you that I have many, many Asian American friends that were on my side. They're just like With everybody else. With a few else. seconds I have left, I mean, do you, don't you believe that the CCP uses this strategy and effectively so, and even used it to shut down the uh, very effective a Trump era Department of Justice China initiative? They use it very, very effectively because we have this, uh, this fear of being labeled as being racist. Uh, listen, uh, there's nothing more racist than people who label other people as racist out of thin air. Amen to that. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party use of disinformation on social media and other platforms is shaping and worsening divisions in American society. We have discussed in this committee how the CCP amplifies, creates, and distorts fake information to pump out to a broad domestic and global audience. Of course, the CCP also uses disinformation to shape public perception and negative attitudes towards the United States and nations across the world. Now, I want to turn to one specific avenue of disinformation the CCP has picked up and run with, particularly since October anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about Jewish people, Israel, and the American Jewish community. To any of our witnesses on the panel, how much of a rise in anti-Semitic propaganda from the CCP have you seen targeted at the Chinese domestic population since Hamas's horrific attack in Israel? I was speaking in uh, the social media in, inside the country or inside China or in the U.S.? Inside the U.S. I, mean, um, I haven't seen good studies in terms of, uh, you know, whether the Chinese government is, is behind a, the rise of anti-Semitic uh, 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 content on uh, TikTok. Um, uh, I, I, it goes back to the, uh, you know, the recommendation I made earlier in terms of, uh, you know, we can make it happen. We can have a law, Congress can pass a law to make you know social media uh, companies disclose you know what kind of content they are promoting uh, at the behest uh, at the request of uh, governments, including the Chinese government. And China, within China, it definitely there. I mean, this is an area of study. Uh, there, the Chinese government is definitely propagate anti-Semitic. Um, anti-Israel um, rhetoric within the Chinese social media. It is very clear since the October 7, uh, 7 um, uh, attack by Hamas, just there's, there's a dramatic rise of anti-Semitic uh, content on the Chinese social media, and uh, Chinese state media is part of that. Uh, uh, it was, Chinese state media is a big reason why there's so much uh, anti-Semitic rhetoric on Chinese social, social media. Dr. Yu, I see you. You want to briefly? China? Yeah, I think uh, China is the regime that requires and demands, as a matter of fact, a unanimity of opinions. If the government decides this is the, my uh, opinion, and everybody has to follow it. So that's why when Chinese government refused to denounce Hamas, and that's it. So everybody would know if you are expressing pro-Israeli uh, a, a position, you'll be punished. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what happened. So now it's very dangerous even to be uh, pro-Israel inside China without suffering some kind of a, a, a punishment. So that's the climate of uh, the, uh, the environment. But I think, you know, uh, I think of course government is an, an added better. The reason why China chose this moment uh, to uh, take a decisively anti-Israel position 
is because they, China regarded Israel as a close ally of the West uh, in the Middle East uh, in this region. So that's the basic trigger. Of course, there's also another, other uh, 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 reasons that can, can date, to, date all the way back uh, to, to Karl Marx's anti-Semitism, about which I wrote an article recently, so I'll be happy to share later. Just take a note. Uh, just a, a general comment that uh, uh, reinforcing my colleagues here, uh, Chinese state media has been uh, strongly um, one-sided against Israel in its coverage from the beginning um, of this crisis. Okay, thank you. As we unfortunately know all too well, online disinformation leads to dangerous conditions for American Jews at synagogues, community centers, and on college campuses. As our American Jewish community and other communities like the Muslim and Palestinian populations in the US face a rise in hate crimes and attacks since October, I urge this specific point to be a top priority for us all. We cannot allow foreign actors, including Iran, Russia, and the Chinese government to inject anti-Semitism or any other hate into American discourse. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a statement from Amanda Bennett, CEO of the U.S. Agency for Global Media, which emphasizes these very critical points. Without objection, it will be entered in the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. I'll start uh, with TikTok. It seems to me that all of the evidence and all of the testimony and all of the data we have heard about TikTok tonight makes it very clear that this is nothing more than a terrible and toxic piece of CCP malware that is a conduit for propaganda. And I would just ask anybody out there who still has it on their phone to take it off. Uh, secondly, I guess I, I would turn to you, uh, uh, Dr. Yu. I, I really liked in your testimony as you talked about discourse dominance, really uh, policing speech, because that, that is clearly what the CCP attempts to do, not just in China, but globally. Unfortunately, it seems to me that one arena where they have been pretty successful is with multilateral organizations. In 2018, as you well know, they uh, pr successfully proposed what is now ridiculously called the win-win the approach, whereby uh, countries guilty of human rights abuses aren't held accountable, but rather there's a commitment to dialogue. This is very transparently an attempt to reduce scrutiny over the Chinese government's human rights abuses. And since then, it seems like there are all kinds of ways in which the United Nations and other multilateral organizations don't hold China accountable. And China works hard to make sure that they are not held accountable. So Dr. Yu, give us some sense, am I wrong about that? Uh, is this indeed a legitimate threat? Well, uh, Congressman, thank you for the question. And I think, you know, the uh, uh, dialogue, you know, win-win, uh, uh, those are coded the words uh, from the Chinese country, which mean totally different uh, things. Uh, 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 there are very soothing words that we hear they don't feel like good about the Chinese realism or rational. You know, that's why uh, I have this uh, big problem with the word uh, competition with China. Uh, because uh, competition means uh, two things. Uh, one, competition, like all races, you have one winner. Right? You cannot have two winners, that's not competition. Right? So that's why the win-win situation is just, uh, just uh, nonsense, it doesn't exist. And most importantly, because China frames this U.S.-China engagement in the overall uh, context of a epic struggle of you die or I live, ni si wo huo, therefore, it will be unimaginable for them to accept losing. They must win, because this is about the regime's survival, right? So that's why Win-win is just it's just it's just an illusion. So that's why competition is not really. Another thing is uh, competition assumes there is both sides of computers uh, competing will, uh, will abide by the same set of rules. China doesn't follow rules. So this is all sort of a, a, a massage of uh, of the semantic words. 
So, so what are we to do about it? I think Jake Auchincloss and I take turns every other meeting with one of us talking about how, uh, you know, if we are pulling back a little bit from engagement with the Chinese Communist Party, that doesn't mean that we should go toward isolationism. Instead, it should mean that we pull our allies in the global south ever yet closer. Yeah. It seems to me that those coalitions at the United Nations and elsewhere can be an incredible American asset. But so what do we do at these multilateral organizations at the UN where the do-gooders just refuse to hold China accountable? All things boils down to the Latin listed question, what is to be done? <laughs> you just ask the question, right? Uh, many ways. I think we talk a lot about uh, uh, the, uh, the TikTok and other uh, malign uh, devices and actions, and we feel we have a sense of helplessness. That's because our system is fundamentally incompatible with the Chinese system. We cannot ban legally a app from the Chinese Communist Party, which everybody agree is very, very bad. That's because the Trump administration did issue ban, executive order, banning WeChat and TikTok. Within weeks, it was overturned by a court in California. So we, unless we change the legal framework, place national security above normal business things, and Congress has a lot of work to do to frame that in the overall uh, context of national security the way we did it in 1947, right, with the National Security Act to combat the, uh, the existing threat coming from the Soviet Union. And this issue is going to continue. We're going to talk maybe a year from now. We'll still be talking about TikTok. So that's the problem. We have to do something that's more uh, comprehensive. And the uh, same way we have to do uh, with the multilateral organization, because the uh, uh, United States is just one part of the multilateral organization, but we're the leader. This discourse power is real. This propaganda is real. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back. Don't forget soybean power, Mr. Johnson. Sorry. Uh, Ms. Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is such an important hearing to expose and discuss CCP propaganda here in the United States of America. I want to thank you all for your, your testimonies and answering of tonight's questions. I want to dig at a little bit more of the why, and particularly around the why, the, the costs. So why is the CCP investing in propaganda in the United States? And that's not a naive question. Is it economics? Is it political disruption? Uh, is it greater influence? What is the end goal? And based on some of what was written here for, for tonight, what is our understanding of how far the CCP is willing to take this propaganda machine that they are perpetrating and putting down here in the United States of America? If we have a sense of the dollars or the types of investments, because we, we know, and I speak to you as a member of Congress representing Michigan, we've got a whole heck of a lot of other things that we are reckoning with when it comes to the CCP. We are reckoning with unfair trade practices, we are reckoning with a, a trade imbalance, a trade deficit, illegal dumping, currency manipulation, uh, 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 IP theft, and whatnot. Why propaganda? Why are they going this way, and what are they getting out of it? And I can tell Dr. Yu was just chomping at the bit to answer the question. No, I was just, uh, just uh, being amazed by the complexity and the sophistication of your question. Uh, so uh, here's the thing. Uh, very simple. United States is the most consequential country in the world. Uh, you like it or not, we actually can make a lot of things happen. Number one, not only because we're economically strong, uh, not only because we're militarily strong, but also we have a huge global alliance. Uh, the alliance, major, our major allies in the world, particularly our major allies were all around China's periphery. South Korea, Japan, Philippines, India, you name it, right? Australia. And China has huge, uncompromising territorial dispute with every one of them. So that's why we are so important to them. If they can sort of talk us in uh, to follow their orbit, and then their problem uh, in the we region. We are solved. private sector companies. Exactly, it's private companies. I know we are the largest investor to China, it, uh, but, but it's important for the region's survival, for economic development. So everything we do, 
We do it in a big country way, and that has a global impact, particularly impactful on China. And the U.S. dollar is also very important. That's why they want to change that system. But before they change the system, they have to change our hearts and minds, particularly our leadership's willingness to resist. How are we acquiescing to a nation that that commits genocide. You know, we got a chairman of this committee, a ranking member of this committee, who've, you know, brought private sector partners to the table, and it's blind eye, blind eye. We attempt to put up the guardrails here, and I appreciate that your response wasn't sarcasm, because a lot of times we view propaganda and it through the lens of history, and it looks much more simplistic, and we here in America really, you know, uphold the standards of individual freedom and whatnot, but these are broader social mechanisms of which I very much appreciate our, our conversation here tonight. But the other point I'd like to, to make um, with my remaining time is around data privacy and third parties. You know, we, obviously we don't have the data privacy legislation that we need to be successful, but it's these third party brokers that are now getting access to our data that are also helping to inform decisions, particularly uh, if that third party broker is from the CCP. And so how can we install guardrails in industry applications of AI or other data analytics to make sure that it's not being transferred directly back to CCP controlled servers that through data brokers or data sharing requirements are you know, just benefiting Chinese companies. With 30 seconds, Ms. Wang. I think we can have law to uh, restrain um, transnational data tra uh, transfer. I think this is something that can be done. The other is to uh, enforce, uh, implement um, uh, data, minim data minimization uh, on, on social media companies. If the social, company, social media companies can't collect the data in the first place, then they, they can't sell the data. So I think these are two, you know, two ways to address the issue. Mr. Venice. Oh, were you, oh, I have you here. Were you here at the, yeah. okay, Ms. Steele. You're a gentleman, Mr. Jimenez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having these hearings because I'm learning so much from each hearing and each witness is coming out. And CCP censorship and disinformation is dangerous to citi Chinese citizens and democracy. It is alarming and disheartening to hear about Chairman Xi's tactical and propaganda campaign against its own people. I'm not gonna read my uh, introduction, but I wanna just go straight to the question. Ms. Wang, you've been talking about the more transparency for data related to social media, and then you said that we need transparency law. United States is very transparent. The problem is CCPs. So how, what, how and what kind of transparency law is gonna be really helpful? I mean, I would say, one, you know, you can have a law to force TikTok to be transparent about what kind of uh, information it's promoting, it's censoring, it's suppressing, uh, especially if those kind of actions are taken uh, in response to foreign government's uh, requests. So you can, that's a very clear example. If there's a law that says that you have to do that, then TikTok has to disclose that information, then we all know we can discuss based on that kind of information. Um, you know, that's just uh, one example. Um, well, like, we can do that, but they're not really releasing it because we have a lot of problems, just universities, UC Berkeley received $220 million from CCP, never reported. So my bill is coming up next week. But, you know, not just that, for all the ports, same thing too. They're controlling our uh, cranes, and they're controlling data tracking systems, and they're doing it. No matter what kind of law that we create here, it's very tough to CCP to respond. And we don't have any problem with Chinese people. We have a problem with the CCP. So, you know, we really have to study a little more about that. So, you know what, I was like, I keep thinking about it, that how can we have them to become transparent? Because nothing's transparent, you know, about CCP. And not only that, they're just investing so much. They're the one building all these infrastructures, Africa. 
And how about Indo-Pacific region, all these poor countries we're talking about, Indonesia, Malaysia, and other countries. And at the same time, South, uh, you know, South uh, America. But they're the one building it, and these countries cannot pay for it. Then they're the one controlling it. So it's very important that we work together, our allies, and you know, we can go out there that you know, stand up to, actually, uh, the CCP. So, Mr. Car uh, Garnow, that your comments on Taiwan, although not surprising, cannot be ignored. You stated that Chairman C is working to position the U.S. as the aggressor should the CCP invade Taiwan. They are ready to do it in 2027. How will they use misinformation to achieve this goal? And who will be used as a pawn in the CCP's plan to invade invade Taiwan, and what do we need to know to prevent these actions? Uh, I think the first job is to read the signals clearly that are coming out of China to, to um, hear and understand and read Xi Jinping's words in context and understand what he is saying. Um, I think that often the Xi Jinping, uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party is most effective in shaping narratives, not necessarily by what it promotes, but what it suppresses, and its ability to impose a cost on people who want to talk about um, these problems and challenges. So I think one of the most important things that can be done is to shine you know, a light uh, to support people who, uh, like my colleagues here, are uh, uh, you know, courageously taking risks to talk about these challenges, uh, and to do a much better job of, of caring, learning, focusing, paying attention, and understanding the um, hi historical context uh, and the political context uh, with, uh, for how China is speaking so you don't get caught in these discourse traps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question to Dr. Yu, but I'm gonna just submit as a written request. Great. Thank you. Mr. Jimenez, a true gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Wang, I'm, I want to say three words, um, incessant, pervasive, relentless. Can they describe uh, uh, the, the CCP's activities here in the United States and elsewhere around the world when it comes to trying to mold uh, the minds and opinions of young people in the United States and, and around the world? I would say they are pervasive and relentless. Uh, but not necessarily incisive because I, sometimes I don't uh, oftentimes I don't think they do a very good job just because the system is uh, rigid no, I, uh, I said in sense incessant incessant yes, yes. Th yeah okay. yeah that I agree that okay. uh, they have been doing disinformation across uh, the, the, the globe and they are in, uh, invest uh, more money into uh, global disinformation campaign and they have become more uh, you know the uh, they're doing more in more languages, targeting in uh, 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 audience in different geographies, and also they are, uh, you know, invent, reinventing new ways of doing disinformation, such as the, uh, uh, including the use of AI of creating, you know, disinformation campaign, including the use of uh, foreign social media influencers, you know, the TikTok influencers, Instagram influencers. So they are uh, creating having creative ways of uh, do, doing the disinformation, for sure. Look, and it appears that they're having pretty good luck. Uh, if, if, if the correlation between uh, their activities, uh, if you look at, um, at what the general population is, and, and the question is, in general, in, this, in the conflict between Hamas and Israel, do you side with a Hamas or Israel? When you look at 18 to 24-year-olds, it's 52-48. When you look at, at folks my age, it's 95.5. Uh, and you look at people 25, 34, it's 71, 29, and it keeps going down until you get to people my age where it's like 95.5. I find it alarming to, say, to think that young people actually would side with Hamas uh, on, on the conflict between Israel and, and Hamas. But to me, that's an indication that what they're doing is working. Um, there's also one other, one other word that I'm going to use is subtle. Um, and when I was a young boy in Cuba, um, under a communist regime, uh, I was being indoctrinated, subtly, 
but I was being indoctrinated. I had to wear a little red and, and black armband. I had a coloring book and a, and a, and a stamp book of the revolution where I, where I would have to get all these things and get rewarded. Uh, and, and the reason I'm here is because I, I asked my father once the question of whether, you know, who was, who was better, the United States or the Soviet Union, and they were teaching me in, in, in school it was the Soviet Union. And he said, oh, yeah, okay. I, a month later, we were here in the United States. And so it's also subtle. Um, and, and it goes beyond that, too. Even, even in, in, in movies, uh, there's a subtle message. In the, in the movie The Martian, uh, the, he's stuck in Mars. The U.S. sends up a rocket to try to you know, supply him to, to, you know, until the next Martian mission. That blows up. It just so happens that uh, the CCP has a spare rocket, okay? And they're the ones that send the rocket up to, to save, you know, the American, making them the good guys. In, uh, in the movie 2012, the ships that were built to save mankind were built, you know, by the CCP in, in China. And so all that is subtle messaging that they're, they're good, they're good, it's, it's, it's okay uh, that the CCP is fine. Um, Mr., uh, Mr. Yu, you said that, that Amazon uh, two-thirds of their vendors are actually from China. Is that correct? Um, did you know that, that when you buy from Amazon, you have the faintest idea where that product's coming from? In most cases, uh, uh, you, can, you can figure out if you have an alert list. Yeah. Not really, though. You really can't. If you're a normal, if you're a normal uh, buyer from Amazon, you can't tell where that, where that uh, product is coming from. Or Generally, where. I agree with you, yes. Okay, so... That's why you know we'll be introducing some legislation to to correct that. Uh, I would hope so. Good. It's, uh, it's called the Country of Origin Labeling Act, uh, and that all online online um, vendors have to tell you where that product comes from. Not to say it has to be banned, but at least you know where yeah. where that product is coming from. Uh, Congressman, there is uh, also uh, enormous amount of economic crimes committed by many of the sellers in China against Amazon. By the way, they fake their reviews. Uh, to gain advantage, they, st they stole Amazon's corporate data, right? So they dominate, I'm not this is a criminal, but they dominated some of the key uh, uh, home security uh, devices, internet router and uh, Wi-Fi extender. You cannot buy anything but uh, those made in China. So and many of the Wi-Fi have a uh, factory set, uh, passcode, so, in other words, they have access somewhere in Fujian and Guangdong to whatever going on in your, in your house. So, that is a massive data uh, collection risk. Uh, Congress must address that. And uh, because commerce servers are in the United States, so Chinese got, uh, do not feel very safe. So, now they created this thing called Temu and Shine to basically try to squeeze uh, Amazon out of the uh, uh, huge market share. And uh, Congress also should look into that. I believe this committee actually looked into that uh, at some point. Yeah. And those are very dangerous. They want to not only dominate the information space, but also e-commerce space. And there's also a lot of tax evasion uh, because of, uh, of the distance, because of the, the, the nature of the e-commerce. So uh, I, I really urge Congress to look into this, uh, this issue seriously. Thank, thank you, uh, and my time is up. Mr. Chairman, I would, I would hope that we've been talking a lot about TikTok. Yeah. That we have our own internal, um, some kind of I'm hearing just on TikTok, what are we gonna recommend to Congress that we do about TikTok? I've heard enough yep. that TikTok is a malevolent influence on, on our country, uh, and I hope that we could, uh, we could come up with a, a recommendation for, for Congress to pass some legislation. Thank you. I share that hope, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do wanna talk about the CCP's digital policy and. The, the troubling nature of that. Before I do that, the, the title of tonight's um, hearing is Discourse Power, the CCP's Strategy to Shape the Global Information Space. And when I, uh, there's, I look at a few things. China borders roughly 17 different countries. They don't have a good relationship with any of those 17. Um, they live in, China's a surveillance state. They have no natural allies. Um, no one wants to immigrate to China. Uh, they um, are really untrustworthy in many different ways. So when I think about 
That seems like a, a strategy or a recipe for failure in them shaping the global information space. So, so what, how am I wrong about that, Mr. Yoon? Thank you, Congressman. You're not wrong about that, but you have to understand that the China, that's why one of the most important national policies of China is called the leverage and dependency. Uh, China re recognizes uh, its unpopularity. I mean, they know it at the highest level. Therefore, they want to create a uh, uh, global dependency on China economically and trade-wise and also, most importantly, technologically. So they want to dominate those, those areas. So you have to really rely on China for those kind of uh, things, even though you, you don't like it. So, but you have no other choice. I think deep inside, a lot of businessmen uh, um, in the U.S. they don't like the way uh, how China handles uh, foreign companies. But you know, all international capital goes after cheap labor, right? There's a lot of a uh, market as well. It's it's always temptation. So China always represented possibility. The reality is terrible. So that's why they hook you on that, and then you cannot really uh, really get it. So that's why I think there is a beguiling part of the Chinese national policy. Uh, uh, despite the, the obvious fact, as you said very correctly, China is not an appealing country. They would want to go there, but you, if you want to make a, uh, make a uh, you know, why the West was terrible, gunshot, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of other things, bad things, but it's very attractive to a lot of people. So that's uh, maybe it's not a very apt uh, uh, comparison, but it's very much similar because certain people like that, but the more and more uh, people, uh, a country in, in, in the world are realizing uh, that actually is not ultimately not going to be the solution. The more China engage with certain countries, China will become less popular in those countries. Look at the EU. Look at China's peripheries. Those countries dealing with China uh, 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 most frequently. So China's popularity in, in those countries very very low. China's unpopularity ratings in Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, Taiwan, India, Australia, is in the middle to upper 80s percent. Right? In the United States, right now, is 83 percent unfavorable. So China is not a very appealing country, but a lot of cars made in China. A lot of cheap goods were made in China, sold to us through Amazon, through Temu, through Shine. So therefore, there is that kind of contradiction at the economy there. Go ahead, Mr. I'll, I'll just point back to uh, the end of 2012, when Xi Jinping came to power, just so we don't um, underestimate uh, his capabilities and the system's capabilities, it seemed then, uh, it, you know, I was in Beijing talking to people who were around him and I was aware that there was, um, you know, a group of um, powerful people in China who wanted to take China down the sort of course that it's gone down since. And it seemed almost... Um, unimaginable that it could succeed at that point. Uh, we've had, we'd had 20 years of weak leaders where, where no single leader had been able to confidently control the military. Corruption was everywhere. The internet seemed to be kind of extending people's knowledge boundaries, uh, people traveling abroad. Uh, within a few years, Xi Jinping did what seemed to be unimaginable and turned and bent the internet from a, an agent of freedom an opportunity to the opposite. So my point is just I wouldn't underestimate um, Xi Jinping's China's capabilities to pursue its objectives because uh, there is a single-minded commitment um, that he thinks the rest of the world lacks. But do you think long-term that's a recipe for success? Uh, how do we define success? Like, it's, a, it's been a recipe so far for accumulating power. Ms. Wang, do you have any comments? I think it's appealing to other authoritarian governments. They wanted to be China, they aspire to be China, but uh, China is not appealing to a lot of people in, you know, in countries like Africa or in countries in uh, Latin America, but it's appealing to the, the dictators that rule over the people. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Hood's line of questioning um, and Mr. Garno's point uh, reminds me of something that President Clinton said at the time he was arguing for a WTO session for China, which is, along the lines of good luck trying to keep the internet out of China, it would be like nailing Jello to a wall. We kind of figured out how to nail Jello to a wall with a, a party sanitized and controlled internet and digital ecosystem. I'd also, well, first of all, thank you to our witnesses whose written and oral testimony in response to questions was fantastic and I've learned a ton over the course of the last uh, two and a half hours. Uh, I want to footstomp something that Mr. Y Dr. Yu said 
uh, correct me if I got this wrong, but it's that the most powerful person in China is not Xi Jinping, it's the visa officer at the U.S. consulate, because everybody wants to come to the United States. Uh, and I think that's, well, one, it evinces something that uh, Reagan said uh, to the British Parliament uh, in addressing the Soviet Union, uh, which is that one of the simple but overwhelming facts of our time is that of all the millions of refugees we've seen in the modern world, their flight is always away from, not toward the communist world. Today on the NATO line, our military forces faced east to prevent a possible invasion, but on the other side of the line, the Soviet forces also faced east to prevent their people from leaving. So it should remind us, even when we're dealing with very complex and difficult issues, that on this battlefield, smokeless or otherwise, we have advantages. Uh, we, we are the good guys. Uh, and so thank you to our witnesses for reminding us of that fact. Questions for the record are due one week from today on December 7th. And without objection, the committee hearing is adjourned.